and a very good day to you, ladies and gentlemen. Today we will continue in a manner of speaking our conversation about models and archaeology, and specifically how we document, how we utilize models in our analysis of uh, archaeological material. This is a technology that really came into its own only in the past decade or so. While models have always been part of the archaeological process from the 1960s onwards, uh, batten and frame models, uh, half hole models, all of this has always been used in determining shapes of models. But now we have begun also making models of the sites as they are found on the bottom. This also is the result of the opening of the deep sea for archaeological rather than purely exploratory purposes. If um, 15, 20 years ago, all that we could do was drop down cameras and uh, film what is visible, but could not really hope to do any useful archaeological documentation, with the advent of 3D photogrammetry and softwares, I really hate to admit it, but uh, Agisoft MetaShape works quite well and usually was quite, uh, the staff were responding directly to questions by archaeologists, but this is what we were using during the Black Sea Maritime Archaeological Project directed by Professor Jonathan Adams uh, of Southampton University. And uh, during that uh, project, this really was when 3D photogrammetry and ship model, this sort of models that you see here, uh, came into their own. These are direct printouts of some of the archaeological sites that we documented. These are sites that are at such a depth that it is not practical for divers to reach them and to operate and document material in the traditional way. Therefore, an alternative way had to be found. I have said it in all the public talks that I have given about this project that really 10 years before we did this project, it would have been utterly technologically impossible to do what we did. By now, of course, this is pretty much standard operating procedure for deep water. Is it the best way to document a wreck site? Well, it depends on the conditions, depends on the situation. I would say no. In an ideal world, in an ideal situation, uh, I would rather have a diver down on the wreck than have three, even the best 3D photogrammetry in the world. There are many things that photogrammetry catches, but it catches it at a supercilious uh, level, uh, not in depth. Well, when an archaeologist, when a human brain uh, reaches the site, then the context become much clearer. Then people can, by drawing, by hand measuring, by hand drawing, you are thinking through the process. So you are, um, in a manner of speaking, in touch with the shipwrights who put the vessel together. There are things, there are details that neither the 3D photogrammetry nor scanning nor any other modern technology can capture at the same level that the human eye and human hand can. You don't have to be a talented artist. I mean, yes, there are exceptional artists that produce masterpieces ready for exhibits down on the bottom. Professor Kevin Chrisman from Texas A&M University is one such uh, extremely talented, both archaeologist and artist. Another one is Jonathan Adams from Southampton. Oh, both of them produce such drawings underwater on mylar sheet that if I could produce them on dry land, I would have given up uh, academia. I would have set up uh, as an artist by now. But the, so you don't have to have that talent. You all you have to do is to see things and the context between these things, uh, materials and to be able to put it in three dimensions on your sheet of paper to see what is there, to understand it, to measure it properly. So yes, as far as I'm concerned, and I have the experience of carrying out this sort of work also in shallower waters, in 2022, uh, my colleagues from the Center for Underwater Archaeology in Suzopo in Bulgaria, uh, led by Dr. Dragomir Gerbov and myself, uh, began the documentation and excavation of an Ottoman period uh, shipwreck that is preserved up to the upper deck. And there, because it is shallow enough, we are actually diving and excavating and 
Comparing what the photogrammetry catches, which is done very, very well, and what the two of us are catching by drawing by hand and measuring, it's light and day. In this context, I would like to uh, return to the subject of these models. And specifically, let's look at a few of them that I have displayed here. These are some, though not all, of the more interesting ones. They range over a give or take a couple of thousand years. I will begin in reverse order. Over here is a model that I frankly find quite interesting. This is a 3D printed um, model based on the documentation that we carried out. The bow of the vessel is right over here. We see the knife heads, we see the back end of the bowsprit here. The forward end is down in the mud broken off. This is the stem of the ship. Over here is the lower part of the mast. Here I have to say that it, the, uh, the fault is with the model, not with the wreck. The mast actually continues way above. It's almost completely preserved in situ. Only the top mast right over here is still lying in the ground. Aft of the mast here, you see a uh, capstan. And this is what uh, archaeologists and maritime historians call trap capstan. As you can see, it does not have a drum head as a modern capstan. This is a type of capstan that has existed since Roman times and disappeared around the year 16, between 1670 and 1680. It was completely superseded by the modern uh, drum head capstan, as you see. This is the small quarter deck of the vessel. I'm using the word quarter deck. It is quite unlikely that uh, the Ottoman sailors who operated the vessel would have called it that, but it hardly matters. Over here, again, the photo is with the printout, uh, the stern post and the rudder blade right here at the end survive on this vessel. If you look uh, on the other side of the vessel, what you see here are all, all the frames are still standing, but much of the planking has already fallen off the side of the vessel. That is because these vessels in the Mediterranean in general and in, in the Black Sea tradition, most Shipbuilding was carried out with iron fasteners. And of course, as centuries pass on the bottom, these wrought iron uh, fasteners disintegrate, rust through, and so the planks fall down. Which explains why our uh, team fairly quickly started calling these wrecks the IKEA wrecks. Everything is there, it is just like a kit. You have everything, all the bits and pieces, you just need a screwdriver to put it back together. So much about veneration of the past on our part. Here are the riding bits. This is particularly interesting model, that's why I'm including in our talk. Here are the riding bits into which the bow sprit would have been butting, and this is also where the anchor cable would have been belayed. But look at the small scuttle right behind it. Almost certain that's where the cable would have entered. And now, besides the capstan, I would like to bring your attention to the main hatch of the vessel. It is off-center. It is not on the center line, it is to starboard of it. And the center line itself has a very thick king's plank. The ship overall is quite small, it is about 18 meter long vessel. As to date, we suspect that it is probably 18th century first half of the 18th century, mid 18th century, somewhere in that period. I would like to bring your attention to another one of these models. This vessel is also from the Ottoman period. Um, I suspect that it is an older vessel, although we have no positive evidence to this effect. As you can see, it looks like a jumbo of timbers. This is the stern with the rudder blade still in place. It hasn't moved anywhere. In fact, the tiller is right here next to the frames. It has fallen down nowadays, but it is still in place. This vessel is the one that you are most likely to find by googling the Black Sea map. The model, the 3D model, was done by Dr. Pacheco Ruiz, who is currently the archaeologist on HMS Victory, together with other colleagues, including uh, Felix Pedrotti. What is interesting in this vessel? Well, a couple of things, actually. 
First of all, look at the open longitudinal hatch in, along the center line of the vessel. It has two very steep, very well-pronounced protruding combings along the center line. It has the mast right up here. It has right over here is the aft part of the mast partners, which would have locked the mast in position. It has the bits forward of it. As a second, this is actually a top mast that has fallen downwards and stuck itself into the co into the quarter deck. Over here, you can see some of the protruding planks. This vessel is interesting for a couple of things. First of all, it is fairly elongated. Yeah, the beam to length ratio is quite favorable. But also is the only one of the vessels that we discovered that is very heavily decorated. The top of the rudder, the tiller is uh, carved. The stand here, there was a crutch here that again, I've broken it off unfortunately. But there is a crutch here that is decorated. The bits over here, both of them have flower carvings on them. The carvings, especially on the bits, are practically identical with the carvings on the bits of the only galley type vessel that survives from uh, in history. That is the so-called vessel known as Kadurga from the Istanbul Museum of, Maritime, of, Not of Naval History. I'm sorry. In the Naval Museum, you can see that vessel. It has been suggested by others that it may be the galley of the last Byzantine Emperor. My late and much lamented colleague, uh, Erko Tarczak, and Professor K Jamal Pulak proved beyond trace of a doubt that almost certainly dates from the mid-17th century rather than older times. Be this as it may, this is why I suspect that this ship may be contemporary with the Kadurga, which would place it around the middle of the 17th century, 1648 thereabouts. The bow is here to the left and you can see the stem is still protruding and you can see the part of the mast. You can see the sprit, the long sprit for the sail and there are a few yards in place that would have carried square sails on the same mast together with it. But it is really the spectacular carvings and the decoration at the break of the quarter deck here that uh, make the vessel of great interest for the observers. Since I have started with the most recent vessels, first let's continue in reverse order talking. Farther back, this is a vessel that was one of our first most spectacular discoveries in the year 2016. It was by the time that we found it, it was at the end of 68 hours of non-stop surveying. Everybody had gone to bed except yours truly and Dr. Pacheco Ruiz. The two of us were the last men standing. In fact, Rodrigo Pacheco Ruiz had just entered to tell me that he's going to bed too. And I'm very welcome to knock myself to pieces with more. Rex, we expected it to be another Ottoman ship. And as he and I were chatting, the ROV approached this, and ROV is a remotely operated vehicle, approached the quarter deck right from this side, actually a poop deck, it is not a proper quarter deck. And we could see these stanchions of the rail. And behind the middle stanchion, we had this huge round timber continuing upwards. And as we were debating what could that be, I asked the pilot, uh, Brian, to bring the ROV upwards. And as it brought it upwards, at the top of this timber, we found a notch for a tiller. It proved to be a quarter rudder, medieval vessel par excellence. We knew at that very moment that the vessel must be no later than the beginning of the 15th century and quite possibly older. Now, thanks to C-14, we know that the ship actually dates to the middle of the 13th century. It is a, what in the Mediterranean world would have been known as a round ship, despite the fact that, as you can see, the beam to length ratio is close to uh, 3.8, if I remember correctly. This is one of the vessels that are under study by Professor Jonathan Adams at Southampton University. I'm looking forward to uh, his publication of the vessel. Over here, standing the 
topsail sheet bits, or what we would nowadays call that. The two masts, again on the model, are broken, but in reality stand to a much higher uh, level. And also the Latin yards are in place. It is not visible on this moment, but um, on this model, but under the Latin yard here in this quarter of the vessel, there is a small dinghy, a small boat. The bow is here to the uh, end. So this, as you can imagine, has made a huge noise around the world. This is one of the very few vessels of this type that has ever been discovered. In fact, prior to this ship, we had never had a complete such wreck. All right, so we have spoken so far about the late vessels. We have spoken about the late or high Middle Ages. In the next video, we will move back in time. We will talk about the early Middle Ages all the way back to the Roman period. So with this, I would like to wrap up this video. Thank you so very, very, very much for watching, for commenting, for liking or otherwise, for subscribing. And by all means, I'm looking forward to reading your comments and doing my best to answer them. So any questions, any comments, I'll be delighted to try to address them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and I hope to see you next time.